I'm talking English right now. So. All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming to our talk. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Um, our talk is a bit weird sometimes because, you know, besides this purely a security conference, uh, but our talk is actually mixed between a bit of business, a bit of data science, and a bit of security. Um, I think you guys will find it interesting, but hey, give us some feedback at the end. So our agenda for today is this one. We're going to explain to you guys who we are and why we're talking about this, uh, where we use machine learning and data science in cybersecurity. We're going to talk about something called the image workflow, which my colleagues will explain after what it is. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what it takes to analyze an image in an automated form and also talk a little bit about data visualization. When I said, you know, just now that we're going to talk business, data science and security, it's exactly those topics. So security in general, because the data we're playing with is security related, data science because image analysis, and the business part because you guys can have the best data in the world, but if you don't have a proper way to show it to your clients, it's not really worth much. So, uh, my name is Tiago Rich. I'm the CEO of Binary Edge, and the team that's presenting here today all belongs to Binary Edge. Um, there's Florentino, he's our data engineer. He takes care of all the plumbing that involves between us getting the data and sending it from one pipe to the other, to one place to the other. He takes care of all that. Filippa, uh, she does a proper part of data science and machine learning at, at Binary Edge. She works with models of machine learning. She does data quality, analyzes that you know we're not losing some results or that we can optimize algorithms in scanning, things like that. And Anna and receives all of this data from us and then transforms it in a way that is useful for our clients and the people we're handing the, over this data to. And they're all going to talk about their different areas. As a whole, it might seem like four different talks, but you guys need to understand that this is a pipeline. There is me telling them, I want this data. I'm the business requirement. There's Florentino and Filippo working, making sure we get that data correctly, we transport that data correctly. And then there's Anna transforming my requirements into something I can end in to the people that ask that of me. If I had to describe Binary Edge, uh, this is the perfect image to describe it. We play with machine learning, we have some hacking skills, uh, security is our domain expertise, uh, lots of statistics because you know you can put it in a fancy way, but machine learning data science is just you know advanced. <coughs> so how did, exactly did we get here to mix data science and security? Right now, Binary Edge scans 200 ports of the entire IPv4 space per month. That's about 1.4 billion of events a month. Uh, and then we also do torrent monitoring. Right now, that number is way, way bigger. We're monitoring way more than 746,000. Uh, and this keeps increasing every month, and it also generates a lot of events. So as you guys can imagine, we've got this huge, using a buzzword, data lake, uh, and we needed a way not only to you know, make it useful for our clients, but also for us to do some exploratory data analysis, which brings us to interesting things that I'll show you guys in a little bit. Uh, when I say we scan the entire IPv4 space, it leads to things like this. This is one way of representing our scans. Uh, each of those dots, if you guys actually see the map, doesn't actually have any lines. It's all based on geolocation. And these are all, each dot is an IP address where we found some service running. Another way of also showing the same image, it's like this. If you see some color on the different ASNs, it's services that have been found on IP addresses associated with those ASNs. And essentially it's us looking at different types of coverage that we have. It's either geolocation coverage or coverage on the different ASNs associated. Um, with this type of data and this quantity of data, as I said, ma many questions appeared. How many IP addresses did we find in job X versus job Y? Uh, what's the most common service on port 80? How many SSL certificates are expired in the entire world? You know, and all of these questions led to a combination uh, of two things that was the answer. Data science, machine learning. And that's how we decided to create the team that now is the data science team. So data science is actually pretty cool. There are different areas. Uh, they're separate things. Sometimes, sometimes people confuse them a little bit. So for data science, we use it a lot for doing the initial analysis and cleanup of the data, exploratory data analysis. So you know, actually extracting some knowledge from this data, understanding you know some correlations, things like that. Data visualization that Anna will show you in a little bit, and knowledge discovery as well, which I'll talk a little bit further. 
machine learning, you've got things like classification, clustering, so joining things together in smaller groups, identification, similarity matching, which as well you guys see this being used on our image workflow, which they'll show in a little bit. And then I've got a note on regression. Regression is usually used for things like forecasting and prediction. It is my personal opinion, and do not make it binary edges opinion, this is my personal opinion, Tiago Hicks, that regression is not, doesn't work that well in security. And the reason for that, or well, some of the reasons, is these things. Right now, machine learning scenarios are not prepared for cybersecurity, in my opinion. You've got lots of adversarial scenarios, so not even the classifiers are working with people that you know are amicable and want them to be good sometimes. Uh, for prediction, the scenarios and data are too volatile, and you don't have proper sources of legit data that you can use to train your models. Uh, and of course, the same thing for lack of data in quantity and quality to train those models. So there's still a lot of work to be done to actually properly use machine learning in security. What I'm saying with this, is it that machine learning is not useful in security? No. I'm just saying that it's not a silver bullet. You have to grab your problems that you have in security, break them into smaller problems, and about 10% of those small problems can be solved with some technique in the science and machine learning, but it's definitely not a silver bullet. And if anyone is trying to sell your product that says it is, they're lying to you. Um, there are some good cases of machine learning being used. Things like antivirus, pattern detection, IDSs, IPSs. For source code analysis, there's lots of people that have done some really good progress in that area. Uh, and also for sentiment analysis applied to emails, tweets, social network of employees. So if you guys have got a company and you know the Twitter handles of their employees, you guys can collect some of the tweets they tweet about the employee, do some sentiment analysis, understand how they feel about the employee, and it's possible that you can detect some outliers that can possibly be some internal attackers. But again, it's all a bit of hocus pocus still, but parts of it also work. Uh, I could stay here all day and talk to you guys about the data we collect. This image you know, shows you what we currently acquire. Um, but I'm not going to do that today. I am showing you this image, however, because I just want to run through some use cases of why having all this data is important and interesting. Anyone knows what this image is representing? Or anyone can guess? Let's go with that. Anyone? Okay, so the three big balls that you see there, the three big circles, the white, the purple, and the blue, were the three biggest data leaks that happened this year and that were shared via torrent. And essentially what we do is we grab these torrents, we add our system monitor it, which means we can see which IPs are sharing that data and which ones are seeding it, which ones are downloading it, all of that. And the fun fact is then when we cross the data we got from all those three torrents, as you guys can see, there are some that downloaded you know, two of them. We then cross this with trying to identify who those IP belongs to. And fun fact, all those IPs and <coughs> either belong to China or from military institutions. And you know, this is what it's interesting because all of these data leaks were of private governmental data from Turkey, Philippines, and US, <coughs> if I remember correctly. So, you know, states are also monitoring this type of stuff. They're also downloading this data. They are using it for something. Another case, this one. Anyone wants to try and guess what it is? Again, um, the ball, what? I know, point at this one. So <laughs> the red circle down here was the Turkish torrent uh, that was leaked. And we were quite lucky because when this torrent was announced, we were awake and we managed to start monitoring from the beginning. And there was one IP address, this one right here, that was sharing this data for a really long time and straight from the beginning. So it's possible, again, this is all interesting correlations, right? That that was the initial seed of that data. From that, we triggered uh, a query on our other platform of port scanning. And there we found that that IP address belonged to a Turkish government institution and had RDP open. RDP screenshot had an email on it. That email had a Facebook account associated with it, which was from a system administrator that belonged to the same government institution that the data leaked belonged to. So again, it's an interesting correlation, might not mean anything, maybe it does, but there is the possibility that the initial leaker of this was an internal person. Um, 
So as I mentioned, you know, we've got lots of types of data, but today on this talk we're just going to focus on that tiny, tiny, tiny piece over there. Why? That piece is interesting because we usually come to situations like these where we get millions and millions of screenshots <laughs> from VNC, X11, RDP of the entire internet and we needed a fast way to search through them because I don't want to waste my time looking at Windows lock screens, I don't want to waste my time looking at Linux consoles that are locked, I want to see useful stuff. And so did our clients. So we worked on them building this and now let's hope the internet works. Let's see, does it work? Cool. So, images. As you guys can see, these are all screenshots that we take of the entire internet. And this is quite boring. Who agrees? Cool. So, what if we wanted to look at some really cool stuff, like uh, SCADA? Anyone doesn't know who SCADA, what SCADA is? Critical systems, right? Stuff that runs the water pipes, the stuff that runs your electricity to your home, things like that. We want to search, for example, for alarm. In reality, what just happened here, I did a search on the text that's inside these images. I am not searching banners, I am searching the text that's inside these images. Let's see, I typed alarm, and as you can see right here, alarm. People might think that this is a fluke, so shall I, you know, try and challenge fate? Give me a keyword. Don't go too complicated, right? Give us something common. Bank? Nuclear. Nuclear! <laughs> Let's see then. Oh, <laughs> this is going to be interesting. Okay, so can anyone help me out? Does anyone see nuclear somewhere? Please tell me you do. Yeah, yeah. Right in the middle. Where else? Nuclear physics. Nuclear physics. So, <laughs> don't I deserve the clap at least? Come on! <laughs> so, what other, what other cool stuff do we do? Um, we tag images. Uh, we found something really interesting. We've got a mobile provider in India. By the way, I hope all of you are older than 18 because we're about to get NSFW on this. Um, we've got a provider in India. Interesting enough, they sell this model of Android phones. All of them have X11 open to the internet with absolutely no authentication. So you find stuff like this. These are all mobile phones in India that are completely open. Uh, oh, thankfully no porn. Um, so yeah, as you guys can see, you know, this is some of the stuff that we find. Um, what else? Uh, let's just go back up here. Search for porn. <laughs> <Not safe. laughs> well, there you go. Um, so, if I go back to Windows, right, and if I type something like John, uh, sorry, let's just go John. Can you do it on him? <laughs> we can, but we won't. Just a second. I'll, I'll let you guys play around with this in the workshop, right? But I just wanted to show you guys something real quick here. So, you guys see this John Donnelly, whatever. One other thing that we do, oh, I'm in dev, great, just give me a second. Sorry, apology for that. Images, John. Can we get a John here? Oh, come on, just give me a single ring. So, a couple of things that we do as well, as you guys can see here, every time an image comes into our pipeline, we calculate similar images. To that original image. What this allows is that if we find something that we find interesting, like Honeywell, we can just click on it and we'll get access to all the other IPs that have that same image without having to manually look for it. But I just wanted to quickly show you guys something here, but it's being a bit complicated. Let's just see. And I promise it's my last demo. Come on. Let's see. Let's see if I'm lucky. All right. So the other thing we extract. It's a cute guy, right? We also detect that there is a face present on the images. And we do this for millions and millions of images. Every image that we acquire, we do this for it. Uh, one last thing that you guys might find interesting as well, uh, those of you that do know Windows well, uh, you'll see, going back to our John Donnelly guy, um, he's got an email right here. 
we extract all these emails from these things and we throw it against an API we have internally that collects all data leaks we find on forums. Uh, if you guys have heard of Have I Been Pwned, we've got a copy of Have I Been Pwned internally. So we automatically know there's this set of IP addresses that belong to a company. They have RDP open. They have these users. These users have their Facebook profiles, these LinkedIn profiles. There's, they've got this email that we extract from RDP and they are present in these data leaks. So it's a lot, a lot of information. Uh, and I'm now going to pass over to Florentino. Oh, just before. We went to Pixels Camp, a conference about two or three weeks ago, and everyone had a public IP on the Wi Fi. Yes? Sure. What about privacy? Privacy of what? <laughs> it's public data. Privacy of the activity. You are. You are Uh, not for us, but because if, if you have any question or so that your pin detection law, right? Yeah, so uh, one of the first things that we did uh, when we started the company, we hired a company of EU and Swiss, or Swiss data lawyers. And they gave us a set of guidelines that we need to follow to be within the law. So, and that's where my privacy concern is at, essentially. Because, you know, then I just go, lawyers, take care of this, and it doesn't become my problem. Uh, at Pixels Camp, everyone had a public IP address and automatically we caught RDPs and things like that open because people still get protected by NAT. You know, everyone always criticizes NAT, security by obscurity and all that. Security by obscurity and NAT have been protecting you since a really long time. Uh, and now I'll pass over to Florentino who will actually talk to you guys about some details on the things that we do. So. Now that you have scared all of you, uh, <laughs> I'm going to get uh, a little bit technical. So, uh, you just saw uh, our portal, which is um, maybe the best thing we have. And it's really interesting to take a look at what is behind that portal. So, we gathered a lot of data about these images. And the way we provide that data and other sources of data to the portal is through micro microservices, REST APIs. Um, we found that this was a really simple way of uh, creating uh, an architecture that can deal with several types of data and it's really lightweight. So, uh, how do we get this data? Uh, when we scan the internet, uh, any target, um, there are types of scans, those uh, for VNC, RDP, X11, that can or cannot generate uh, a screenshot. And if we get a screenshot, we create a queue of work that we then send to what we internally call our image workflow. Now, what is this? Uh, we decided that we wanted a robust way of processing all these images. And as you, as you might guess, uh, finding logos, detecting faces, uh, running OCR, this is kind of heavy. So we needed to create something that would scale. So, um, there are options on the market to create things that are distributed and scalable, but we, did, we, we found that we didn't like any of them, so we built our own. And we did this by creating simple Python modules, each one um, responsible for a certain task, and linking all of them. And uh, we have uh, on the cloud, um, let's call it a queue, and we put work there, and the, the modules just go there and pick work. What this allows us is that if you need more power for a certain task, you just launch another process, equal to the others, and it just needs to go get work to that queue, and then store the data that it collects in the database. In this way, you can easily distribute and scale. Uh, there are some concerns. Uh, you have to do a lot of error handling, and uh, stuff like that. And when you work with the cloud, there are lots, lots of errors that you don't know that you're going to get. So it's kind of uh, an iterative process, and this is not perfect yet, but we, it works pretty good. Um, if you can afford using cloud services, do it, because uh, it takes uh, a lot of work to maintain uh, databases and all of that. There are errors everywhere. So if you can avoid that uh, overhead, please do. 
Um, so what exactly do we do? Um, when one of them, I'm going to talk about the workflow as a whole and not each module. But essentially, um, we generate a notification each time we get a link, a screenshot. And we take that image and we start by extracting the target metadata. And then we create a, a signature. And this signature, you can think of it as encoding the whole image as a string. As you might have guessed, uh, you lose detail, but this allows for fast comparison. So how this works? Uh, this is really uh, a hash. Now, for <laughs> pretty much most of, of you here, when we talk about hash, you immediately think about cryptographic hashes, and this is different. Cryptographic hashes, uh, they are more about the properties of the file itself, and this type of hash is called a perceptual hash, <coughs> which um, really takes the properties of the image itself. So this allows for uh, an image that is slightly rotated, different colors, to be classified as the same. So when we receive an image, we just generate that small string, the signature, which is very quick, and then we generate small uh, partial substrings. Uh, we then, in the database, we index <coughs> all of these small strings, and when we want to search for similar images, we go to that index, to those indexes, and we get partial results, partial matches. And then we only have to compare a small subset of images. Uh, this way, we can obtain, as you have seen, the sim similar images on the fly and very quickly. Uh, it wouldn't be scalable to compare every image with every other image. So, um, Afterwards, we perform a little test on the images. Um, as you might guess, I don't know if you could see before, uh, a lot of the images that we get are really black screens, and that's garbage. We're not going to run run OCR against that. It's not going to give us nothing. So we perform a little test that my colleague Philippe is going to talk more in detail afterwards to check if the image has any relevant information or not. And if it does, we then perform some more interesting stuff on it. We have several tasks, uh, logo detection, face detection, OCR, even porn detection if you want. Uh, and we enhance the image for each one of these tasks. And when we say enhance, we say applying certain filters like, for instance, ray scaling. Uh, then we perform these tasks, and then uh, with the results we can do, well, if we have anything else we want to do with those results, <coughs> this is when we do it. Uh, for instance, when we get the results from OCR, you might want to run the emails against our data lake API, and so on and so forth. Uh, now I'm going to pass over to Filippa, that's going to talk more in detail <laughs> about um, the algorithms that we use on those steps. Uh, so as Florentino said, the first step of our image workflow is filtering. Where we try to just remove all the images that do not contain relevant information for our case. And like completely black screenshots. So one very obvious way of doing this type of filtering is just to check how many colors an, an image contains, and if it contains only one color, we can discard it. But if I have something like a completely black screenshot with a white pixel somewhere, uh, well, this type of image also doesn't give me any useful information, and if I apply this rule of also discarding images uh, that contain only two col colors, I'm going to lose very interesting information like common lines. So, a more flexible way of doing this type of filtering is using the concept of entropy, more specifically the chain of entropy, that is given by this equation. And for images, it gives us like a measure of the complexity. So high entropy values correspond to uh, great information content or to more complex images. For example, oops, it's really bad. Just a yeah, that's better. Thank you. Uh, so if I have a completely black screenshot, all the pixels are black, so the entropy will be zero because I really don't have any type of information in this image. But if I have uh, like a common line, the entropy will be greater than zero because I have a little bit of information. And in the last case, I have a highly complex structure, so the entropy will be much greater than the other two. Okay, turn on. Thank you. Uh, so with this in mind, we can then define a threshold where we keep only the images containing a certain degree of information. 
So now I'm going to show you a notebook that we prepared for this presentation. Uh, where I'm going to show you how Uh, so I'm going to show you how you can use very, very simple libraries in Python uh, that you can use to detect the faces, to detect the logos, and to extract all the text. So the first thing I'm doing in the first line is just importing the OpenCV and Pure libraries. There are image processing tools. And here is an example of the type of image you find a lot. So of course, this is an image created by us for this presentation, but the truth is you find a lot of this type of Windows 10 screenshots where you have the, the user's photo, the email, the name. So our goal is to detect that this type of image contains a face, to extract the email and the name, and also classify this screenshot as a Windows 10. Let's go. So let me start by the face detection. One, uh, the most used approach to detect faces is, of course, to build a model with a lot of images containing faces and images without faces. And you can train your own model, but there are plenty of models that have been trained with thousands and thousands of images. And one of those models uh, is the biology framework that is very popular. Uh, although it, it was published in 2001, so a lot of time ago, and nowadays we have more sophisticated things like deep learning, but for this presentation, presentation, I decided to talk about the biology, biology framework because it's really simple to use, it's fast, it works really well in most cases, and it's available in OpenCV. So the details behind of this really clever framework uh, are uh, out of scope for this presentation, but you can find all the details in the original paper. This is titled Rapid Object Detection Using a Boost Cascade of Simple Features. So for this presentation, I'm going to show you how you can use this framework in Python. So the first thing you do here is to load your image in grayscale because it simplifies the process a lot. And then you have this, the Viologen framework available in OpenCV in the class called Cascade Classifier. And you have to load that XML file that contains the pre-classifiers, in this case for frontal faces. You also have available other um, classifiers for uh, eyes, mouth, profile faces, upper body, lower body. So you just have to load the XML file of the things that you want to find in your image. And then you just have to apply the, the classifier to your image. And as you can see, we have a set of parameters that must be tuned depending on the type of image you have. And if faces are detected, it will return the positions here. And then you can draw like a box or a square around the face to see where the faces were detected. So if I just apply this um, in our RDP screenshot, you can see that both faces are detected. But if I change just a little bit this value here, these parameters, they're related with the scale of the image, you can see now that the smaller face is not detected. And if I increase it just a little bit more, both faces are not detected, right? So this tells us that these parameters are really sensitive and you should know what they mean uh, because uh, the success of this algorithm will depend only on the type of the image you have and so you have to, to optimize these that parameters. And you can find all the details again in the Biologen framework and also in the OpenCV documentation. So now let's move to the logo detection. The really most simple approach to detect logos is to use this concept of template matching. So I have a template and I have an image, and I want to know if that template exists somewhere in my image. So I, what I can do is just to slide the template over my image and compare the, the, that part of the image and send them to the template. And in, in Python, in OpenCV, you have a class called your match template that compares to images and returns a metric, for example, the correlation coefficient. And you know if the correlation is very strong, both uh, images are really similar. And then you can create a function like this one to slide the template over the image. Uh, so for this example, my template is a Windows 10 uh, logo. And you can see that you can find the logo in the right place. So this is a really, really simple approach. And there are two major problems with that. The first thing is if the, your template is much smaller or much bigger than the template that exists in your image, it won't be able to find it. 
And second, if we have a lot of interactions in this first cycle, of course, it, it will be a very slow process. So depending on the type of image you have and depending on your goal, you can use more sophisticated things. For example, you can train a model that learns to recognize certain logos in your image. But for that, you have to have a reasonable number of images for training, and sometimes it's really difficult to, to get such a data set. Um, and finally, you try to extract all the text. So in Python, you have this OCR engine that is called PyTesseract. And you may think that applying OCR tool is a very straightforward process, but it can be a real challenge, because the ideal scenario for an OCR tool to work is to have an image with white background and the letters in black. So if I just apply this to our original image, you can see the results, and it's really bad, right? I don't have anything here. Uh, so now if I convert this image to grayscale and apply again the OCR, as you can see, it's a little bit better, but it's not perfect because my goal is to extract all the text or at least the email and the name. So let me show you what are the results that we are obtaining uh, in binary edge. So as you can see, we are able to extract all the text, but it's not perfect because I have some noise there. Uh, but at least we are meeting our primary goal, that is to detect all the text. So the trick here to apply an OCR tool is just to apply filters to your image before you apply the OCR tool, because your goal is to just erase the background and keep the letters that you want to recognize. So summarizing from our RDP screenshots, we uh, we detected the, the face, both faces. Uh, we extract the email and the name, and also uh, we found the, the Windows 10, so we can classify this image as a Windows 10 with screenshot. And now I'm going to pass over to Tiago. I guess. Uh, all right, so back to me for closing this up. Um, as I mentioned to you guys, um, we do you know, we've got this whole scanning thing. And before I hand over to Anna, the reason why I'm doing this small, very, you know, 10 second demo is that she's going to show you lots of different other types of data and how to visualize them. So I wanted to actually show you guys, you know, that data before she talks about how to visualize it. So let's try and do something here. Um, user stream, let's see if we can pull this off. Uh, terminal. So what you guys are going to see here on the left, it's going to be my user stream. And my user stream is essentially the stream where the results I ask for in a job get delivered. And now we are going to try and request a scan. Um, what? OK, so can you guys tell me, uh, pick a country, please. Russia. <laughs> a nice country. I don't want to, you know. France. France. Sure, let's go with France. Anyone knows the country code for France? Is it FR? Yeah. Right, so does anyone not understand what I'm writing on the left? You can't see it. You can't see it? Oh, it's too, too small. Um, anyone knows how to increase the font size? <laughs> so, let, let me just go. Essentially, what I wrote here. Uh, anyone not really increase font size? Anyone? Ah, uh, that's such a pain. View. New. View. So make text bigger. That's like. Better. Make plus. View. Nope, that's not working. <laughs> that did not work. Hold on, no worries. Uh, a common, common match. Yes. The problem is this is a Mac and I don't even have the plus because it's a Swiss keyboard. <laughs> Love it, right? Bigger. 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 Yeah, that was great. Jeez. Okay, let me know when you can actually see it. Nothing? <coughs> I'll just point it out. You'll be fine. So, <laughs> we're triggering a job. We're essentially telling the platform, please scan France on the port 5900 using our VNC module. Right? And our VNC module is the one that takes screenshots on VNC. 
And what you guys are seeing here is a real-time scan of all the IPs in France. Uh, it's detecting which ones have port 5900 open, and hopefully in a second, we'll start seeing some screenshots popping up. Uh, I'll leave that running for a second, and in the meantime, uh, public API, let's go with this. So we've got modules for all sorts of stuff. We've got modules for SSH, we've got modules for MQTT, we've got modules for RDP, and I'm going to show you, for example, for SSH. So that means if you ask scan for us with the SSH module, this is all the data we'll return to you guys. So the IP, the port, all the ciphers, all the algorithms, all the public keys that the, IC, the server returns. We return all of this information. And we return all this sort of information for all the different modules, for all the different protocols. Which means it's different types of information, therefore they need different visualizations. And this is what Anna is going to talk about. Let me just see if we start, well, I'll leave this running and maybe we'll start to get some screenshots because France actually has quite a large IP range, so we'll see oh, what happens. How you determine that those IP ranges belong to France? Uh, because we have a GeoIP type database thing that essentially tells us these ranges are assigned to these countries and they get updated every 24 so hours. Maxman and some others. There are some other databases. So you can cross use. information across GeoIP databases validated actually that belongs to specific Yes. And also routing data or not? Not right now. No. Um, so and I'll just pass over to you for a second and you can do your part and then we'll, maybe we'll look at the scan after. So I'm going to talk about uh, data visualization and just uh, I want to show you the the pipeline or the workflow we use for data visualization visualization for all our types of data. So first, when I receive the, the data, like in the format you saw in the, um, the black screen, I need to, to see the variables and what's interesting and think about the audience and who I'm going to present it to. And then I'm going to think about the, um, the representation I want to, to show, the details, the tools to use, and then finish, finish, finishing up. But I'll show you this in detail. So first, before showing all the types of different types of visualization, I want to tell you that for me it's really important to experiment and spend some time and some good time um, testing different visualizations, try it with uh, the team or friends, colleagues, and see what works. This year it's a really bad example. Um, we wanted to show the, the, the how many open ports does an IP have, and it we ended up not using it because it was really overcomplicating the idea we wanted to, to transmit. So next, um, the, the, the results we have here, I, I had to cut it a little bit because it was really a huge amount of data and you wouldn't be able to see. But um, a simple visualization is this uh, Venn diagram. Not all visualizations need to be complex, just need to be understandable. Next, we have the, the top 10 web servers for the web. And uh, here I want to mention that it's really important to pay attention to, to the details and be precise when creating a visualization. For example, if I, didn't had a, if I hadn't truncated the x axis on zero, it would, it would distort the way we, you would look at the data. And um, consider the the calculations that you need to do to, to be precise in the lengths or areas or whatever you, you are showing to, to give the right information and not um, give the wrong perception. Uh, here we have uh, relational data. We have on the top the six email protocols and then they are grouped into... Thank you. <laughs> they are grouped according to its encryption and their color encoder to, to make it easier for you to read. Then here uh, we analyzed uh, big data technologies, MongoDB, Memcached, and Redis. Uh, each square uh, represents two terabytes of data and we analyzed over a period of a year. And you can show the differences uh, of the, uh, the amounts of data exposed during that period. And then special data, of course, uh, the 10 most vulnerable countries to, to Heartbleed. 
And going back to the images again, with the DOCR results, here's a simple word cloud, top 20 words most commonly found on VNC screenshots. Then uh, I'm going to show you this, this data in, in two ways. This one, I added a legend title, subtitles, and a font that's easy to read. And now I'm going to show you a different visual, it's the same visualization, but doing, uh, done differently. That's going to highlight the importance of spending some time in the details. Here you can see with the different fonts, uh, for example, considered sloppy font, uh, Times New Roman or um, Comic Sans, it, it doesn't have, it doesn't show the, the, um, the data in such a beautiful way as, uh, as you've seen before. And it makes a difference when you're presenting this to clients. And just to, to finish up this part, uh, color code is a great way to, to give emphasis to some data. Uh, you can see that uh, the first two boxes are the ones that had most, the, the higher counts of IP addresses with those keylines. And then one thing that we always discuss at Binary Yet is of course um, comparing automation with originality because those visualizations were created in um, Illustrator or could be any other tool, but it took a while. So it would be much faster to do it with a programming language, Python or R, and just do the fine tuning in Illustrator. But of course, it doesn't have the same effect and loses a little bit of the originality. So it's important to find a good balance between the two. And then just to finish up, um, it's really important to document every step of the process, like the calculations for areas, every choice of uh, visualization according to the type of data you have. Um, review everything and for the future consider what you could have, been, could have done differently, what could be better of course, and take constructive feedback, even if it means to let go of, it, of a visualization like I showed in the, the first slide. And now, Tiago, please. So, to finish up our talk, uh, just two more slides. Uh, first one, we published the study of the entire IPv4 space, publicly available at isc.binaryedge.io. We looked at a couple of protocols, uh, we published you know, a couple of, some of the slides you've seen today are extracted from these reports, so feel free to have a look. Uh, the other thing as well, we've got a little something for you guys. We've created actually a small comic that explains how we came together as a data science team. Anyone that wants one, feel free to come and get one. Um, and any questions? That's it from us. Uh, yeah, ask away. Uh, oh, sorry. Prior. Go on. Um, two questions. Have you got um, uh, what uh, database do you use for research for your results? Depends. Um, so right now we've got about I would say five different technologies just for databases because depending on the type of query you're doing, depending on the type of data you storage, storing, you want different types of databases. Um, what happens if uh, the internet goes to IP IPv6? Uh, we're already scanning IPv6. Uh, we're definitely not going to do it you know, the way we do IPv4 because it's impossible. Uh, but essentially what we do right now is we torrent stuff and we've got a couple of servers on the NTP pool. We're starting to collect these lists of IPv6 addresses that are already allocated. And instead of brute forcing it the way we kind of do with IPv4, we're just going to start scanning those until it gets to the same level of scanning we have with IPv4. Uh, yeah. um, my first question was about IPv6, but uh, several others. <laughs> One is about facial recognition. Are you doing it actively and comparing with other with other type of, of tools like OC tools to correlation between uh, all the the social media plus the the information you are gathering about the devices? So, um, as the lady over there mentioned before. That's kind of the line of where we stop. These correlations that we did with the torrents was pri private for us, and we would never provide our clients the ability to do that on our platform. We're a data gathering and data selling company. 
yes, happy to say that. The data correlations that we do for our studies, it's private, it's internal, and no, we wouldn't do that. So you provide the source data, but you are... And you do whatever you want okay. with the source data. By the way, it's not really whatever you do, because we do vet our clients. We don't just sell to anyone. You know, you guys, uh, you know, maybe some of you work for the Russian Mafia. <laughs> if you come up to Binary Edge and we're not able to vet your background, we will not sell to you. So it's not... But do you sell for governments? Some. <laughs> okay, uh, never mind. Uh, about the devices, are you extracting metadata like this, this green size and comparing different devices so you can grab the banner? So from that's, the... that's why I wanted to actually, you know, have you reconnected your access point again? Which one is it? The one that ends with get the fuck out. Let me just see, because if I can get this running up again, this will answer your question. Um, so essentially, we extract as much metadata as possible. Uh, if you try to identify the service, we'll extract the banner. We you know, extract which version of the service is running in there. And that correlates with an internal CVE database that we have. Um, so yeah, we extract as much like metadata. Like the XP, the, the screen uh, size. Yeah. If, if the, this comes back up again, and hopefully it's taking screenshots, let's see. Come on, give me just one. One, one, one. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Let's just see if, much, if anyone sees a link pop up in there, please let me know. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, more questions. Yes? How long do you hold on to data for? Six months. Maximum that we're legally allowed to do it. Next question. Do you have problems with data quality? With data quality? Uh, we used to in the beginning, and that's why we created the data science team. Um, one of the things that, you know, uh, we've got this big Very client. Good. Cool. Yeah. So we've got this really big client. I'm not allowed to say their name for NDA reasons. They're really, really picky about their data client. They're awesome. And it's great. And it makes us work really, really, really hard. But our data quality, and this is, by the way, one of the differentiating factors that we have versus our competition. If you go to Census, show them, uh, you know, whatever bullshitters are scanning the internet. Show them, for example, they've got 2.5 million IP addresses that have an FTP server running on it. We've got 16 million. The reason for that, data quality improving our algorithms on scanning and all that. A lot of the work that we do is on data quality. What else? Yeah, you can. Oh, yeah, so uh, where was the screenshot? Let's see. There we go. So, okay, let's just go down here for a second first. Can you see that? That's a part of metadata that we extract. So we have essentially the title of the computer. And the screenshot, hopefully, I won't get in trouble. Let's see what we got here. Well, <laughs> thank <laughs> thankfully, it's just a locked Linux console. But this was a real-time screenshot. This did not go to our history database. This, you know, it was real, literally taken right now. Uh, for Portugal, we get lots of things like WinRAS, POSs, things like that. I was just checking if you know, another one would pop up. We'll see. Any more questions for me? Yes? Uh, with the new protection data laws, mm -hmm. uh, I have to say explicitly that I can give you the data to use it, but, uh, but you are fetching all the data without utilization. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand? So, if I remember correctly, you're talking about the new EU data protection law, right? Uh, yeah, we're this company. <laughs> we're not affected by, right now, at least from what we're told, we're not really affected by the EU protection law. Uh, hold on, I had a question here first. Yes? Uh, is there any way for uh, an ISP to say to you or other scanner out there that I don't want to be scanned? 100%. Uh, we, one of the guidelines we receive from the lawyers, we need to have a blacklist. Send us an email to info.binaries.io with your ranges and a way of proving that you are the owner or responsible for those ranges. We'll put them on the blacklist. You'll never hear from us again. Yes? So, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to risk playing a little bit with the devil here again, right? So let's see what happens. Um, your CTO, are you back there? How the hell do I do a free text search? <laughs> he writes text. Really? Okay, so just that? Are you sure? And now how do I see what it got associated with? 
So essentially, you got free text on every single field of data that we collect as well. <laughs> so no correlation, but you're able to do text search across all of these things as well. Again, the correlations that we do is more on the level, OK, we've got this IP address. We've seen it here. We've seen it there. We've seen it there. Can we explore a little bit about you know what services are running on it, things like that? Um, more? Oh, I would, I would like to go to the same subject, because you say you are switch, the switching price. But you sell data for the European countries, right? Sorry? You sell data for the European countries. Okay. okay. <laughs> if you sell data for the European countries, you need to follow the, the EU law. Mm -hmm. uh, so you are obliged to follow it. Okay. Uh, okay, just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sure. No, uh, in regards to the, to the European law, it's actually something that got out quite recently. Uh, we've got a lawyer team that essentially, you know, they'll look at it, they'll try to understand how it works. Because again, this is public data. One important thing is that we don't try any, even default usernames and passwords, we do not try them. This is things that are completely open on the internet without any type of authentication. Okay? Yes? What's your scanner tech stack look like on the back end? Scanner stack. Uh, so, You've got different phases. As I explained, first thing we do is check with ports are open, and then you follow this pipeline as well. On ports are open, uh, we've got the custom scanner that we've rolled for TCP and for UDP. They're separate scanners, just something custom we wrote. You know, it's not very hard. Doing the scanning on the entire internet is not very hard. We've got mass scan, we've got ZMAP. What's hard is actually, you know, <coughs> with the bugs both those well-known scanners have and being able to, you know, receive all those messages at the same time. So our scanners are really common, you know, written in C, TCP, UDP scanners. We then have a custom written service identification scanner. And that's 100% compatible as well with the likes of Nmap and a couple of other scanners that identify services so that we're able to you know, have compatible probes because we do have clients that like to send us the probes that they've written and make it compatible on our platform. So it's a custom written scanner by us to be able to identify services really fast. Cool. And uh, like your scanning nodes, I assume, probably get blocked and shut down every once in a while. <laughs> How have you dealt with that? So that's essentially, uh, I would say, 50-60% of Felipe's job. She has this really cool Sorry. dashboard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she's got this really cool dashboard where she can compare all the different jobs that have the same targets over time. And we essentially try to monitor what's the quality of the IPs looking like. Are we losing something? Because sometimes it's not even about being blocked. Sometimes you know, one of our provi data providers, or Minion, as we call them, providers goes down, and we're losing data from there. And the system needs to be able to think, you know, the tasks I sent there, they're going to be lost, so I need to send them somewhere else. And a lot of the work that you know, Tiago back there has done is focusing on building a really good job manager that can handle all of that stuff. Yeah, I'm sure there's an interesting story as well. Have you like preferred some kind of orchestration <coughs> framework over another? Uh, we, we tried playing around with different types of orchestration frameworks, and we essentially just ended up building our own. Oh, okay. um, because it, it's, it's really crazy, you know, it's something that I would have thought the industry would have evolved a little bit better, but you go to these guys that do task management and job distribution, and it's like, yeah, you guys can have this task, and then you can code it that the next task solves. All right, but I want a dynamic task. I want that if this gets detected, it automatically generates a new task. Yeah, we don't do that. So we ended up building our own. Cool. Yes? Are you doing some kind of inspection to files like metadata and content inspection? So you can not go the doc file, so just extract the metadata in the, the content itself? Um, we've got what we call a recon platform, which I'm not showing here. Nope. Uh, and essentially that um, allows us to do things like the other way around. We put in a domain and it will go and get all of those files, extract names from those files. It goes in the opposite direction instead of so us starting. Like Falcon? Never heard of Falcon, maybe. No, just uh, pulling the files, extracting metadata, oh. compiling, extracting like printer. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yes? Is there any like trends or things that you've come across through your data analysis that weren't of like ever in your imagination of what you'd come across? Yes, uh, absolutely. So VNC, it's scary stuff, right? You find your factory open to the internet. We found, I don't know, all sorts of heaters, you know, things like that. But then we went and scanned for MQTT, and that's when it became real fun. So we found prisons online, like the jail controls of the doors of the jail on an MQTT broker, open with no authentication. We found nuclear research facilities that have the sensors that are measuring the nuclear reactor or something like that, sharing that data in there. We found, have a look at the report I published. We've got the MQTT stuff in there. And for me, in my opinion, personally, scariest chapter of the entire thing. 
Uh, another funny thing that we found, um, we found that there was, actually Anna showed it in, in the slides, uh, we found that there was a break here, I'm just go okay. Do I still have time? Two minutes, cool. Um, this thing right here, uh, Redis, if you check here, there was a huge drop from August to January, it's the yellow stuff. And from our side, we saw that drop, but we didn't think much of it. Fun fact, the guys from Duo Labs came and talked to us. I don't know if you guys have heard of them. Really cool people, do some really good products. They came and talked to us, and actually they found out the same thing, but they found out why. There was some guy that went on show them, extracted all the Redis list, and was logging into the Redis, encrypting all the data, leaving a URL, and locking the Redis, actually making it secure, because the data was no longer exposed. And that's why we see that drop over there. It's when the guy decided to go on his rampage and just lock all the Redis on the internet. Uh, where this? Yes. Uh, Performance-wise, uh, what's the mean time uh, starting from discovery to extraction to classification? Of what? Of the nodes that, uh, that are discovered. Okay, so, yeah, I don't really know the, into that detail, but I'll just give you a metric. We can do the entire country of Portugal, which is 5.2 million IP addresses in about 5 minutes okay. for one port. So, that should give you a metric. The thing is, the way we have our platform prepared, if a customer is willing to pay, we just raise our scanners from 100 sensors to 200 and the time gets off. So it depends. I can't give you a, an exact metric because there isn't an exact metric. There's just the one we use regularly, which is usually we have, I think, 50 to 60 sensors scanning. What else? OK. Oh, one more. Just to follow up to that, what's the largest have you ever had a client use to ask to use all of your infrastructure to scan? Uh, usually, if it's really, really large scans, they just consume our fire hose. So we've got two things that we sell. We either sell, uh, we've got two fire hoses, one of torrent data, one of scanning data, which is the 200 ports we do per month. And if it's really large scans, it compensates the client to just consume that fire hose unless they want some really custom shit. Else, they just do on-demand scanning and then it's usually smaller scans because it's for their clients or for smaller infrastructure, things like that, like a telco, for example, that just wants to scan uh, the socks, the, the AP, the SOC is monitoring, things like that. Are we actually done? What's your book? What's your book called? Book? No, not a book, a report. Oh, right. There you go. Yes? Do you do uh, mobile infrastructure scans? Uh, as in internally? Internally. So, really cool stuff. <laughs> We've got an, an app on the App Store, Apple TV, iOS, that essentially you guys can scan your internal network and it acts as, the same, as a medium that you would on this normal infrastructure. Reason for this. Two reasons. We want to start working out you know, what we can get internally and how to deal with internal data. Second thing, I want these guys to have access to um, the app. You're able to categorize the different devices on your local network. I want these guys in a couple of months to write an automating model to categorize devices. They're going to need good data for that. We're going to use some of the data from the app. Is that it? <coughs> Sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, the information from the data is sent to you? or yeah. is in an anonymous matter, by the way. We don't send the IP source that it came from, the public IP yeah, source. The images are sent. N what images? No, no, the, here there are no images. Uh, the data that the app sends is just, I had this amount of IP addresses oh, okay. with these devices. That's it. <coughs> no images. <laughs> yes? Okay, apparently I'm done. Thank you guys very much.